Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, and welcome to What's New in Aerospace, brought to you by Boeing. Today, we're at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia, the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. And right now, we are sitting in front of one of the most iconic airplanes in our collection, the SR-71 Blackbird. And it is my pleasure to introduce our guest today, someone that flew this airplane, Colonel Buzz Carpenter. Buzz, thanks for joining us today. Marty, it's a delight to be here, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. What you see in front of you is still the fastest airplane in the world. For the bicentennial in July 1976, we set our new world record at 2,193 miles an hour, and we thought the record would last about two years. And here it is 42 years later, and it's still the fastest, highest flying operational airplane in the world. You can notice as people see the airplane and they say they think a, an airplane that goes so fast should be small. But to meet what President Eisenhower wanted, he wanted an airplane that could replace the U-2 that wouldn't fly at 450 miles an hour, it would fly at over 2100 miles an hour, not at 70,000 feet, but at 85,000 feet. And behold in front of you, this is America's first stealthy airplane, long before anybody was even familiar with what the term stealthy means. It's a big airplane, almost like a 727. It's 107 feet long, 55 feet wide, and 18 feet high. The airplane weighs 60,000 pounds, and when we are fully fueled, you can add another 80,000 pounds. So you're looking at a 140,000 pound airplane. The real genius of this airplane along with its designer, Kelly Johnson, who was probably one of the giants of the 20th century, are those two powerful engines you see there. Those are Pratt Whitney J58 engines, specially modified for this airplane, and they're what they're called turbo ram. That means up to Mach 2.2, which is about 1,500 miles an hour. They perform like any jet engine like you and I see on a normal airplane. Beyond that point, they start transitioning into a ramjet. So this is the only airplane in the world that the faster we go, the less fuel we burn, which is really counterintuitive. But it gave us the ability to use these engines and this airframe to be able to fly long range missions. But every two hours we had to come down and we had our own fleet of tankers with our special fuel that would typically be at 25,000 feet, they would pass 1,000 gallons a minute to us. So in 12 to 15 minutes, we'd get the 12,500 gallons of fuel in our tanks we needed, and we would go on our way. The airplane was reconnaissance. We took some magnificent pictures. We also had a radar and also electronic sensors where we could see radars and radio sites, transmitters up to about 300 miles anywhere around us. We could take high resolution pictures out to about 25 miles either side of us and radar out to almost 100 miles. To kind of give you an idea, if I flew over today and we had you all out in the Uvarhazi parking lot, because it's a nice day, and I cross over at 35 miles a minute, I'm at 85,000 feet and I take your picture I will see every single one of you, and I'll be able to identify you as adult males or adult females. If you're holding a piece of paper, I'll see the piece of paper. I can't read what's on it. And that's why six presidents use these airplanes during normal and crisis situation to bring back the imagery so they could render decisions. All right, so Buzz, you mentioned how fast this is. What's the fastest you ever flew in it? Fastest I ever flew in this airplane was probably about 2,230 miles an hour would be my guess. We were not necessarily Mach limited, although there were some Mach considerations. The airplane was temperature limited. Think about the airplane you're looking at, the average temperature of the airplane at cruise was over 600 degrees. The airplane actually grew three to four inches in length, an inch or two in width. My little pie window up in the front of the airplane, that was 620 degrees. My side window was 560. So even in my spacesuit, if I put my hand up against the window, I could only hold it there for five at most 10 seconds. 
because that quartz glass would be radiating heat into the cockpit and I'd have to remove my hand from it. The reason the airplane's black, people think because it's a spy plane. Well, that's part of it. Because if I could show you a picture at 85,000 feet, you'd see the sky above us is very black because 97% of the atmosphere is below you and that's the blue that you and I get to see. The main reason why the airplane is black Black is your best radiating color. And so black helps radiate heat off this airplane into the minus 80 degree air that we're operating in. And because of the temperatures, this airplane could not be built of aluminum, as most airplanes are. It's 93% titanium. And I think what you'll find interesting, we don't have a great source of titanium in the United States. So the CIA set up a frontal company in Europe and we bought titanium for 32 airplanes from the Soviet Union. They never knew who they <laughs> sold it to. Awesome. So Buzz, how did you end up flying the Blackbird? I first saw the Blackbird casually at a distance when I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1967. Later on, I would work for the individual who flew the first operational mission in this airplane, a Colonel Jerry O'Malley in March of 1968. He got me interested in the program. You had to be a volunteer. You send in your physical record, your personnel record, and your flight record, and they did a review. If they kind of liked what they saw, they thought you could, might qualify, they would bring you back to, I was living in Japan at the time with the Air Force, to Northern California, you had a two-day astronaut's physical, a whole bunch of interviews. I had to fly the SR simulator to see how I handled an airplane, and then I flew two companion flights in T-38s, which is a slightly supersonic airplane with current SR pilots to see how I handled an airplane. I was accepted into the program about four months later. I would report the summer of 1975. It, take, it took us a year to train you to fly this airplane because it was so unique and so remarkable. So after a year, you would typically head over to Japan and that's where you'd fly your first operational missions from. Wow. Tell us about a couple of your missions. Probably some of the most interesting missions. We've, a majority of our missions at that time were out of the Far East. Vietnam contributed. I was really post-Vietnam. But uh, doing observations on, on uh, Red China and Russia, we never overflew either of those countries. But we flew as close as any aircraft was allowed to fly. And part of it, when you leave here, if you come up to the overlook, look at the top of the airplane. You'll see a hatch that's open. That's the air refueling hatch, but you'll also see a glass window. Underneath that glass window is 800 pounds of instruments and a special sensor. When I have young boys and girls here, I ask them, have you seen the movie Star Wars? Do you like R2-D2? Well, that box that weighed 800 pounds is the R2-D2 on this aircraft. I kid them today, it wouldn't be 800 pounds, it'd be two Apple Watches. But in 1970s, computers were really bulky. The beauty of this system was, they'd come out an hour 45 before we'd start engines, they'd load all the information into this box and tell the airplane exactly where it was on the face of the earth. We would start engines, and on a day like today, when we pulled out of the hangar, within two minutes, the sensor on the back of the airplane would look through the blue sky as if we were not there, and we locked on the stars. This airplane automatically navigated off the stars, and we guaranteed our presidents 300 feet anywhere in the world traveling at 2,200 miles an hour. That's why presidents felt very comfortable that when they sent us out to do something, we would execute the mission exactly as they had requested. Did you ever get shot at while you were on a mission? Um, I never had a missile fired at me. There were probably over 100 missiles fired at us. Fighters used to come up regularly from Russia, from China, from Red China. Um, you could see them out there. But when you're a stealthy vehicle at 85,000 feet against a black sky, traveling at 2,200 miles an hour, you are a very difficult target. So we never lost an airplane to uh, combat operations. 
We built 32 of the airplanes, and one of the things I show, particularly high school kids, and some of you in the audience will recognize it, this is the last major airplane built in the United States with a slide rule. So there was no modeling and simulation. So you had to, when they built the airplane, they had to go out and see what worked and what didn't work. So we built 32 airplanes, but we lost 12 of them, most of them early in the program. But my wife loved this airplane for a number of reasons. She knew that I really enjoyed flying it and felt that the mission we did was very important. But in those cockpits are magnificent rocket ejection seats. We never had an Air Force fatality. When you got to the point that the airplane was no longer flyable, you uh, used the seat and you lived to fly another day. Wow. Now you mentioned the fuel earlier. Um, mm -hmm. When you take off, the first, there's a couple of questions here. One, is there just like a start button like in your car? And then once you take off, you know, you talked about the fuel, do you take off with a full tank of gas? Those are excellent questions. There wasn't a start button. You had two throttles. And it, these engines weighed 6,000 pounds. So there was a lot of mass that had to be turned over. So you had two Buick Wildcat engines on a unit that sat underneath the wing that had a drive shaft that went up into the engine. And so when they turned the engine at 1,000 RPM, you would advance the throttle and the special fuel that Marty talked about, normal jet fuel, when you and I are on an airliner or the military uses, it ignites very nicely at minus 40 degrees, electric ignition. Because of how hot this airplane was, we couldn't use and fuel that volatile. So JP-7, you have to get it above 335. So we used a chemical to light the fuel. Triethylene boring, we called it TEB, when it hit the air, it explodes at 3,000 degrees and very nicely lights the fuel. So when we started the engines, the TEB would start the engine. When we lit the afterburners, every time a shot of TEB would come in there. Now, if this airplane was getting ready for a mission, most of you would leave the room. You'd say, this is the most dangerous airplane I've ever seen because there'd be all kinds of pans underneath the airplane and fuel would be dripping from almost everywhere. Because the airplane expanded and because of the heat, they couldn't use rubber bladders. So we used silicone as best we could. There is no fire hazard associated with this airplane. Your biz biggest hazard is slipping on the fuel and falling on the hangar floor. Now, when I have kids here, or actually kids of all ages, if I tell you that the engines produce 34,000 pounds of thrust, to most of you, you're going to go, I don't know what that means. So I try to translate it into horsepower. So most of you came here today probably maybe in a Kia, 275 horsepower. I bet one of you has a Ford 150 at 475. Imagine each one of these engines produces 156,000 horsepower. That's how we're able to cruise at 2,200 miles an hour. Back in the 70s when I flew these airplanes, they said a single engine from this airplane could power the Queen Mary that's now docked down in uh, Long Beach. Wow. Now, you, you mentioned the fuel, and actually here in the museum, you can look back underneath the plane, and there are little um, mats underneath it. And when you see those mats, that's because it still leaks fuel. From 1990. <laughs> uh, Buzz, tell us who Kelly Johnson was and, and how he was a, a piece of this. Kelly Johnson. Grew up in Michigan, graduated from the University of Michigan, was probably one of the great geniuses of the 20th century as far as aircraft design. We could spend half a day naming all the awards and the airplanes that he was part of. He designed the U-2, had it built in uh, nine months. The first operational mission was in 20 months. Kelly had a way of you tell him what your requirements are and he could visualize the airplane that you had to create. So when President Eisenhower came up with a problem that the U-2 was vulnerable over flying the Soviet Union, and they came up with the new requirements, Kelly Johnson was able to visualize what this airplane needed to look like. He surrounded himself with an absolutely fabulous team of engineers, gave them the authority and responsibility, and from the day the contract was signed in October 1959, the first flight was April 1962. Think of that in today's terms and when we developed airplanes and other things. You're talking in multi, multi years 
not in terms of months. And so he was a truly amazing individual. I treasure, because when I came in the program, 75 to 81, Kelly Johnson was still around. And we had, I had personal time with Kelly on a number of occasions, and I was able to pick his brain and say, why did you do this or that? If we came back from a mission and we, we took off our spacesuits, and there was a note in our box to call Kelly, we needed no permission. We called down to Burbank, we talked to his secretary, she gave us a time and a phone number, and he was cleared for whatever questions he had. This is our record breaker in front of you. This is one of my favorite airplanes. I have 67 hours in it, like Marty said. 10 missions. My most memorable mission was flying this airplane into the Middle East out of England for a conflict in March of 1979 for President Carter. He was actually in the Oval Office monitoring our nine hour and 45 minute mission. The French wouldn't let us overfly because it, it could have been a seven hour and probably 40 minute mission, but I had to fly around Portugal and Spain. There were five refuelings, nine hours and 45 minutes. Some of our tankers came out of Spain. Some of our tankers came out of Cairo. Operations in this business was always very interesting. One of the wonderful things today is I can share with you and my family, all the things we used to do, because really none of us classified anymore. When I was actually doing that, it was very limited. My wife knew I was in England. She knew it was a crisis. But as I left, the only thing she told me, I don't want to read about you in the paper or hear about you on television. <laughs> and that was what we wanted. We did not want to have any notoriety from any of our, our collection activities. Did this plane have a personality? This airplane had a wonderful personality. It always performed as we wanted. This is the airplane that went from New York to London, hour 55, London to Los Angeles, three hours and 47 minutes. It came here from Los Angeles in 64 minutes, over at Los Angeles Airport, overhead Dulles. To kind of give you an idea, I used to live, leave Sacramento, north of Sacramento, California. My wife would hear me go 117 decibels at two in the morning. There's a reason for two in the morning. Before six in the morning, she would get a call that I was on the ground north of London and I would be back sometime. And the reason we left at two in the morning, because it was a four hour flight, an eight hour time zone change, it put us into England, which is noted for bad weather, at two in the afternoon, which was a better weather time. What's the sound of freedom? <clears throat> This airplane generates a sonic boom. Many of you may have heard it listening to the space shuttle coming in. The shape of the space shuttle, a lifting body, is the same shape. The SR is a lifting body, the forward body. So it sets up a, a double sonic boom. It's a boom boom that if you were outside and I flew over, you would hear my passage. It was about, we had no control over it, about 45 seconds behind us. Sometimes it could be destructive, it could break windows. But also, can you imagine our State Department sometimes task us to overfly heads of state when they were greeting each other and purposely boom them? We did that. <laughs> the three days before Noriega was encouraged to leave Panama, an SR-71 flew over his house to say, you know, it's a good time to leave because the Marines are coming pretty soon. <laughs> How involved with the, the political climate and the intelligence were you, or were you just given a mission and said go, or did you know kind of the background and what was going on? We were pretty knowledgeable. Oh, they tried to isolate. When I first came in the program, if you can imagine, we were not allowed to look at our photography because they thought if we were ever shot down or became captives, they wanted to limit what we knew. Uh, at any time, there were only 11 of us pilots. Through the whole history of the program, 25 years, only 85 of us ever flew this airplane, 80, about 85 navigators. We convinced them if we could see the photography, maybe we could fly the airplanes better to get better photography. So we kind of knew uh, when a situation was evolving. And when you had your briefing before an operational mission, you knew what the operational rules were how you flew the airplane, how it was designed. Kelly was very specific and the team around him in the Air Force. But then at the same time, you'd get a briefing on the political rules of the day. And actually the political rules of the day could be much more demanding. I had a major emergency on the North Korean border. If you can imagine, my airplane went unstable. I'm in a turn. 
I need to roll the airplane out to stabilize it because I risk losing the airplane if I don't. But if I roll out, I overfly North Korea. Overflying North Korea would have been a political no-no. So I had to keep the airplane in a turn. The airplane was actually damaged, but we successfully landed at a South Korean Air Force base in South Korea. And maintenance came up and had to fix the airplane because we broke some things. Was that your scariest mission? Um, or did you get scared on a mission? Sometimes you were very concentrated. Uh, I've actually landed at an airfield in England that was closed. Uh, our rules were different than most Air Force pilots and we thought we could successfully land. The only problem that night was they forgot to tell the tower I was coming in to land. And when I got on the runway, I couldn't see the taxiway, so I had to ask the tower to send somebody out. And they couldn't believe I was there because they said the airfield's closed. Probably the scariest time I ever had was uh, an airplane in Okinawa in terrible weather and I was losing my instrumentation and the ground control, they, they fired the guy who was trying to get me in because he had messed up the approach so badly and I actually had to circle underneath the weather which is in an airplane, particularly this airplane, probably one of the most difficult things you should ever have to do but I successfully landed the airplane and was, was glad to be back on the ground. Now you mentioned the spacesuit. <clears throat> Tell us why you're wearing a spacesuit and, and what did that mean when you were in the cockpit? Anytime at 63,000 feet as normal human beings, the outside pressure is so low that the gases in our blood comes out and you become an immediate fatality. Just like two Russian astronauts, when the hatch came off their Soyuz capsule at 100,000 feet, they weren't wearing spacesuits and they died instantly. So when we went above 55,000 feet, which we always did, initially I had a pair of Gemini suits. The programs interwork with each other. I had Gemini suits for about two and a half years. They weigh about 45 pounds. If you're claustrophobic, it's not the program to be in. The helmet's an additional 10 pounds. It was well suited for the Gemini capsule, but not as well suited for us. So they developed an old new suit called the 1030, which is in the case behind you here. The shoulders were better, better ventilation, checklists were not strapped on, they had Velcro. To kind of give you an idea, before every flight you had to pass a physical. You then had a meal, high protein, low bulk to give you energy. You went down to the suit up room with the technicians an hour 15 prior to the flight. You put on cotton long johns because you're going to perspire. The suit is laying out on the floor. You get into it like coveralls, you come in from the back. You pull the suit up, the technicians grab the suit, you put your arms in, they grab the ring that the helmet will be attached to, you duck underneath, and then you stand up. And the main uh, seal for the suit actually starts right in the back of your butt, and they pull it all the way up right to the back of your neck. And the next thing you're going to do, they're going to hand, they're going to put on your cotton surgical gloves because they want to make sure your fingernails don't dig into the spacesuit gloves. They then hand you your 10 pound helmet. The helmet comes on, you pull it down. Inside here, which you wouldn't realize, there's a face seal and you clamp it down so it's sealed tightly around your face because you're gonna breathe 100% oxygen from the time you start engines until you land. And that is to get the nitrogen out of your blood so you're not susceptible to the bends. Once you have your helmet on, the seal is sealed, but they're going to put on your cotton gloves. So think about you're at home, you take your nice cotton gloves, you then get your dishwashing rubber gloves, and then you put on your gardening gloves. That's why in the cockpit we tried to see as much as we could because you were feeling through three layers of gloves. The suit would provide you the protection. One of the crews ejected at 82,000 feet at 3.12 Mach, and the suit provided them the protection they needed. Wow. Buzz, what does it mean to you to have an aircraft that you flew on display here at the National Air and Space Museum? It is absolutely wonderful because I can share with you the personal experiences of flying this airplane. It's not something I read in a book. It's not something that I saw in a movie. It's, it's the experience of actually working. And I was very privileged, one, to come into the program, lucky to be selected. But what I have to recognize is those thousands of people that were responsible for preparing this airplane from the planners, from the maintenance people, from the tankers that refueled us. 
from the commercial contractors that supported us to be able to make this airplane, to be able to do what the president and the leadership of this country wanted it to be able to do. It was retired in 1990, and people often ask, why? Actually, it did not have a competitor. The Cold War had come to an end. This airplane was intended to overfly and go into hostile airspace, which it did successfully. The Cold War was over. We thought it was going to be a more peaceful world. It was costing $85,000 an hour to operate. When I flew the airplanes in the 70s, early 80s, we figured it was about $50,000. Now, satellites are pretty expensive, so don't, make, don't think they're cheap. They thought the satellites could pick up most of the load. But the main reason I think this airplane was retired, Marty just had one in his hand, and I have it right here. <laughs> Imagine you're President of the United States. You're monitoring a U-2 going into the Middle East during a conflict. I land back in England. They have to download the photo cameras, the recorders, put it on a waiting airplane, fly it across the Atlantic, process it here in Washington, D.C., and then deliver the information to an awaiting president. That's not the world we live in. Think about it. The metric to the president today is 10 minutes. Most of you have cell phones of some kind out there. Think about it. You take a picture wherever you're at, you clip it, and within one minute, you've been able to deliver it anywhere in the world. That's the world we live in, and that's the world that our leaders expect. This airplane, we could never develop a data link. Now, what are some of the advantages this airplane gives you that satellites don't? Satellites are hard to hide. You can estimate for the next 100 years exactly where it'll be. You never know where this airplane's going to show up. So you have to be aware at any time to hide things, and you also have to put out things you want to deceive me with. With a satellite, you can time that because you know when the satellite's going to be overhead. Buzz, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give Buzz a huge round of applause. Outstanding. Well, I'd like to point everybody over towards our Stimmen 30 Facebook page. I know that this is a What's New in Aerospace program, but we have an educational webcast here at the museum called Stimmen 30, and we've created a few resources about the SR-71 Blackbird, including a Google map called Blackbird Bingo. You can go into this map, you can look around and find all of the Blackbirds on display around the country. Take a look, see if there's one that's near you, go visit it, see if they've got a pilot there that you can talk to. Um, and if you ever have a chance to come out here the, to the Stephen F. Udvar Hazi Center, Buzz is a docent here and he can have a, uh, you can take a tour with him. Um, I'd like to thank Boeing for bringing you this show today and all of you for watching. Take care. <laughs>